Hello, friends. <laughs> Everybody's fit as a fiddle. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, good, good to, to see, see you, you all. <clears throat> Take the time to look around at the pages if you're inclined. Let's see who's with us today. Hmm. Hmm. Well, we hope you're well. Not too hot, wherever you are. Not too cold. Just right. Okay, well, let's get started this morning. <clears throat> or this afternoon. This morning for <laughs> someone of you. <laughs> So settling into a seated posture and it feels like it has some balance of settledness, alertness, not trying to force a notion of perfect posture onto the body. but feeling rather from the inside what feels stable it feels relatively settled supported by the earth Invited, opened, animated by the other elements around us. feeling what we feel directly in the body. And all its range of expression. All its movement and change. a sense of space and distance that might come more from the mind. Seeing the ways in which the mind holds the body in a container of notion, of perspective. Sometimes these experiences of physicality fit right in to that bottle.
that the mind has formed out of memory, image, concept. Sometimes the body experience doesn't fit in quite, or doesn't fit in at all. has its own range of qualities, textures, tones. Beyond the words and ideas that the mind tries to contain them in. not feeling like one is more appropriate than the other, but seeing the difference. When these sensations feel like ours, we experience them as discrete parts of a body and feel familiar and known. And when are they more unfamiliar, uncontained, amorphous, indistinct? And trusting that the experience can move back and forth. More familiar, less familiar. More concrete and less. More identified with and less so. Not needing one to be more true than the other. Appreciating the different truths, different ways of experiencing body, mind. This power of knowing of recognition, naming, labeling, identifying. Whether it's something light like pressure, tingling, throbbing, heat, coolness, these words can help illuminate the relationship of mindfulness, awareness, understanding of these changing physical experiences throughout the body. And thoughts can also take us away. 
disconnect from the physical experience into the conceptual, immaterial realms. Also part of our being, our construction, our lives, worth knowing, worth understanding, observing. And the mind too can be experienced pre-verbally. without words. It's said that in the several million years of human existence, language has probably only been around for a couple hundred thousand. And yet we are so tied to thoughts and words, vocabulary, a language of description, of understanding, how amazing and beautiful that capacity is. And yet, we can see there are ways of knowing aspects of consciousness, of awareness, much older, quieter, more mysterious, more immediate. And the body can be known in these ways. The changing experience of what we call body, momentary arisings of physicality, momentary arisings of sound, sight, smell, taste. can be received in this more ancient way. The mind itself can be known without words. Received, understood, cared for. not banishing thought, not fighting it. Not struggling against it. But receiving thoughts as we receive the body and all of our sense experience. Something deeper. quieter, kinder, more wise.
So Michelle and I thought we would uh, continue to just take some questions today if anyone had any about your practice, uh, instructions, anything we might be able to support you with. Seems like the Q&As have been fruitful, so we thought we'd roll with it. Samantha. Aloha, Jesse, Michelle. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, I am Lang Sangha. Um, I have a question that's a little hard to ask um, because it, it has to do with, I think it's worthiness and shame and uh, acceptance of limitations of self. Um, and Jesse helped me a little bit a few weeks ago um, in trying to, you know, see, I, I think it still has to do with doubt, but I'll, uh, I'll describe in my practice. Um, so it's a lot of paradox, a lot of dichotomy. So I've had the opportunity, but I'm very grateful for, to sit a whole lot, more than usual, in the last uh, here for the last nearly few months um, and uh, my practice got to a uh, such a quiet and peaceful space that I've never uh, experienced before and I, I've been sitting for more than half of my life um, and when it gets really deep and quiet um, I'm faced with this real intense feeling. My biggest fear is not having access to the Dharma. Um, that's been my biggest fear all my life. Um, and it feels really uh, like the depth of a dark hole. <laughs> um, I can't describe it better than that, like space, black holes. And, and endless in that no matter how much I try and what I do, at one point I will I will not have access because I'm not worthy of the Dharma. And that's ter terrifying to me. Um, and yeah, I uh, I try to sit with it as long as I can until I, I can no more. Uh, you know, there's a lot of air and earth experiences, especially in the heart, um, gets really tight. And of course, once I focus on it, and it, dis it does dissipate. And depending on how much energy or tranquility or faith I have in the moment, I, I can hold on a little bit, but I, I find myself backing off. And um, yeah, any, any guidance and support, I really appreciate it because it's really hard to do that alone. I think I want to let Michelle start just because you and I have spoken a little about it, but I, I, I would love to hear if you have anything more to say about just like in, like what does it mean what would that mean to lose the dharma that like you wouldn't have access to teachings or community um or something more like your like do you feel like you would lose your own connection to these truths uh like on an internal level that i think i don't have doubt about because you know the felt sense is so intense so strong and so real for me all my life so you know i have I, I like i said to you before i feel like i've internalized enough that even if i'm locked on the basement in the middle of nowhere in the center of the earth i'll be able to connect to the basics um but all of the above that you said um of course uh, losing uh, access to the printed word and the teachers that um, 
shared it with me. Um, but as the, the core is really worthiness in the sense that may not deserve, but it, it sometimes gets even more severe, like things that are not even mine, like images of the end of what well, I don't know what the Buddha called it, but you know, he did say that eventually the Dharma would expire in this realm, I guess. Um, and that is, it's not going to be around anymore. <laughs> I, little, I literally missed the boat. Um, so, and, and having people that I really uh, va value, like His Holiness and you guys, I mean, doing extreme things that are not conducive to good practice. Um, so the images are just, you know, I hate to say this online, but um, like the Dalai Lama stabbing somebody, it's not something that I see. So it, it, it's intensity, like it's, it's extinguished from the planet everywhere. All of humans, not just me, like anybody won't have it. Hmm. I don't want that. Is that more yeah, helpful? that's helpful. Do you want me to start, Jesse? Or uh, yeah, I, for sure. Yeah, I think there's like I wrote four different places that it, this question could go um, in terms of reflecting on it, and I think um, the first guardian meditation of the four guardian meditations is reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha and um, there's a teacher in Burma, the happy Sayado, Myatung Sayado, that I asked about how he did that practice and um, and I, I, I prefaced my question with the, the idea that a lot of people um, on the planet who haven't been born in a Buddhist culture, when they hear the reflections on the Buddhist qualities, that they seem so far away, like the perfection of patience or the perfection of, right, like all the, the qualities that he perfected over lifetimes um, that made him worthy to be a Buddha, um, they, they can seem far away. And so um, he told me that when he moved to the area of Sagain, the Sagain Hills uh, on the Irrawaddy River, I think he went there when he was seven years old. Um, at some point, he he uh, was at a monastery that became his monastery uh, for his lifetime. And he built a pagoda on the top of the hill that was actually, most of the pagodas are white, and this he painted a very light blue. And that I've never seen anything like this pagoda in that when you went in, when you went in the back of it, all the way to the back, there was a space, and then these little steps <laughs> that went up to a little door that if you opened it, you'd see the happiest statue of a Buddha I've ever seen. It was so, it was so happy, and, um, he told me that he sat there for years just holding his mala. <laughs> and um, he would hold one bead and close his eyes and then um, open his eyes and look at the Buddha. And then he would feel his worthiness to be the Buddha, to be like a Buddha, to be enlightened. And then he, he'd open his eyes, look at that Buddha, then close his eyes and take in that he was worthy of um, awakening. And he did that for years. And he said that's how he recommended doing that mm -hmm. first guardian meditation was to just <laughs> uh, hold a bead and then feel your worthiness. And look at the Buddha and and feel his worthiness, and then look, feel your own worthiness, feel the Buddha's worthiness, so that in those kind of 
there's a concentration aspect to this where th there's no distinction right between the buddha and your mind so you don't have to worry about of course it's a bleak time when they're, they're we're out of they call it you're out of the dispensation they call it a dispensation so we're still alive at the time where there's still a dispensation of the buddhas but there are future buddhas coming you know they're the um awakening doesn't depend on time so even if there's no dispensation there's still the dhamma and the, a possibility of awakening of course it's a bleak time when there's no dispensation mm. but i think that the teaching is that everyone is worthy it's like all beings are worthy but most people don't feel that worthiness and then understand the eightfold path right so um i really recommend this practice because i i do it i mean i've done it for so many years it's more like i don't i don't make an effort as much to do it but i used to do it at grocery stores and um driving and airports but what i do is i feel my own worthiness but then i feel everybody's worthiness so i just look at somebody anybody and feel their worthiness or a cat or a, you know it's like a dog or a whale or human or it's um, very important to know uh, to understand the depth of this worthiness and it's a practice yes i get it it's Thank a you. it's yeah because there's other things where there's other places to go which i'll just mention briefly which there's fear and then the object of fear and I think that I think that it would be helpful to not get caught in the object of this fear, but to just feel the experience of fear mindfully. So rather than get caught in the content of what you're afraid of, I would pull it back into just experiencing the emotion of the fear without an object. Fear without an object. So that's the second, I think that's very important practice for all of us, that anger without an object, right? Sadness without an object, happiness without an object. Come, you know, it's just very important, um, which if you have questions, you can ask Jesse or I, and then um, who loses the Dhamma? <laughs> who loses the Dhamma? I'd ask you to ask yourself that question more like a koan. Who, who is it that's losing the Dhamma? Right. And fourth, there's good old Hiri and Otapa. Uh, the Buddha considered um, the fear of not being mindful as a healthy fear. So I, I would, I would, or the shame of not being mindful as a healthy mm -hmm. shame. And I'm yeah. not. I'm just saying again. There's different angles into your question. It's a great question, and it's very deep. And and so. Um, There is a healthy aspect to your question, which is, of course, um, of course, we'd be afraid of losing the dumb, right? Like, you know, I mean, it's like, of course, the world would look very different without access for people with the Dhamma. So, um, you know, that's a whole other branch of the question but i think those are the four things i wanted to emphasize but in terms of one's own um worthiness i think the first the first guard it's a guardian the guardians are protections and and experiencing your own worthiness is a a strong antidote to shame and then of course shame without an object uh mm -hmm. sh shame is not the human um most popular emotion that humans have i mean i would say that we're 
shame, the nature of shame is to be ashamed. And so, of course, we're ashamed of shame. And it's like it's the nature of fear to be afraid. It's the nature of happiness to be happy. It's not personal. It's not I am happy or I am ashamed or, you know, it's like it's the shame feels shameful. It's like, you know, you're your tails between your legs and your ears down and you're like you get it just feels horrible right mm -hmm. and worth, worthiness feels um there's so much faith and right and brightness yeah. of mind yeah yeah so of course yeah. if you're gonna get free you gotta you gotta face this stuff Mm -hmm. you're, do you're doing it and it's coming up and it's clear it's clear you know it's coming out and um i'm going to show you a picture of the happy sayado in case you know. please thank you yeah. oh beautiful michelle you are a blessing oh Thank you. He, he's the happiest human being I've ever met. And he spent years and years doing worthiness. 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 With the happiest Buddha we've ever seen. <laughs> There's a reason why that Buddha looks so happy, right? That was a practice. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's what... Thank you. Very helpful. As always, you make me feel worthy. <laughs> you are. I'll see if I can find a picture of that Buddha. I know we have him somewhere. Oh, yes. Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I might just add a little of, um, like just to fill in a little of, I think, the things that Michelle said of, um, I get just maybe where you ended, Michelle, just to kind of reassure you, Samantha, that it feels like totally appropriate where you are, that this would be what's arisen, you know. Um, if you're, you know, when we are, like you said, you realize just like how fortunate you are to have so much time to practice and that you've, you know, been finding yourself in just a lot of quietude and uh, having a lot of sense of spaciousness and faith and <clears throat> that the, the, you know, the mind is able to settle into these spaces that are very quiet and pure. And to just, it's part of like understanding the mechanics of, of how this all works and, and where um, where the mind heart you know wants to be free in such a profound way and yet also is afraid of the the insecurity that that freedom also represents mm -hmm. um, on on the level of where the mind is used to finding security right and so this sense of like hanging out in this kind of quietude for any periods of time that there's going to be as part of the purification you're going to also get to the places where the mind doesn't trust it right where the mind hits the limit of its faith and and has doubt and has um insecurity around the insubstantialness of things you know and that you know especially in these places the mind is going to kind of throw up obstacles that are the most seductive to us mm -hmm. right it's like the mind knows what is going to be the thing that's going to recontract itself most solidly mm -hmm. into this familiar me as you know samantha and this sense of some of these things that you've mentioned, a fear of losing the Dhamma, uh, a fear of unworthiness, you know, I would, I would feel like just as you described these as part of like your a deep lifelong experience for you, you know, since childhood, having 
you know, such faith in the Dhamma and, and such um, connection to it, that to, to that that therefore it's also going to be the source of a very deep karmic knot, right? Mm -hmm. Of of that's how afraid we are of losing it, right? Because it's it's that old in us. It's that uh, right. it reaches that far back, and so to just feel like you can appreciate that the mind is trying to find ways of like re solidifying, you know, re concretizing. And then the shame and the lack of worthiness, it's like that was, that's clearly, it's like another very deep, you know, karmic entanglement that many of us have. And so um, it's just seeing it at, impersonally as the, this is how the process works. There's the the opening and the acceptance and the relief of that. And then there's the contraction back and the and that it can feel bewildering and it can feel like oh this is the uh, this is in the way of that other experience and that's part of the trick you have to get out of it's that paradox that you're describing of feeling like you can't you can't relate to it that way because as long as you do you're re you're re creating reinforcing. reinforcing yeah that dynamic right versus and then essentially just, yeah, what Michelle is saying, it's like, okay, rather than kind of getting involved in the thoughts around, oh, you know, what would it, what are all the ways in which it might feel like I could lose the Dharma and what are all the ways that I might not be worthy for this? It's just like, oh, fear, right? Fear is arisen and it's coming up with all kinds of content and images and, you know, crazy fantasies, dark fantasy, right? It's like, oh, okay. It's just like, but going back to this, like, there's the fear, there's the fear, and that that's enough, and the mindfulness of that is actually enough material to kind of work with. Or the, it's not just the worthlessness, but the fear of worthlessness, or the fear right. of shame, right? It's like, okay, fear, or shame, or whatever it is. It's like, just like Michelle is saying, it's like, there's, and that's the reason for that, of like why it's important to not buy into the object so much of the fear, but to just kind of pull back into the fear. So, it's just that kind of reinforcement that it's that it's this is this is what this type of experience and this type of bewilderment and the type of kind of like uh, uh, tension is what you would expect given how quiet you're getting you know in your practice and so it's great we rejoice in your horrible visions of the Dalai Lama or whatever. Uh, I, I'm sorry I, I, for that. Oh, no. <laughs> well, it's like the, what are, you know, the, there is that sense of like, wow, we the project, it's pulling back the projection. And some of that is just like whatever, it could be a, a bunny rabbit with a knife you're thinking right mm -hmm. or it can be this person that you hold in such it's just like that image is not the person that's just your own image right mm -hmm. this is all just and it's like it's evocative for you right mm -hmm. and so it's like these conjurings of the mind are just that you know to really recognize that the projection of things is actually not what the things are and it's very powerful you know how we interpret and identify not just identify me with but identify things as 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 what they represent versus they're just images, you know, they're just shadows, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I think lastly that just to the, that what Michelle is saying about, you know, moral dread and moral shame and the Hiri and Otapa, you're already, that that is already obvious to you because you've expressed that of like you are tr you are pushing forward in terms of like you're finding another chunk of time to practice this summer and another chunk of time to practice in the winter it's like this sense of you don't no one knows how much time they have no one knows what the conditions might be that change it and so that when we have these conditions when you have you're able to take the time that you're you're going full steam ahead that's exactly the point of what michelle is saying it's like some of this these things are also healthy. The fear of undependability, right? The fear of we might not have enough time. Uh, there is a healthy dimension to that, which is mm -hmm. to put a fire in us and to motivate us, you know, and that, that you are already taking that message in a very clear and coherent way is, is great, you know. So it, it, sounds, it sounds wonderful and hard, you know. So there's a reason why. Thank you both. Yeah. Uh, 
as hard as it is because of the quiet and the tranquility it's mm. uh, there's a lot of joy and um that experience of being exposed to our unworthiness makes me feel more worthy of the Dharma mm. in it of itself. So thank you for the time. Thanks mm. for the airtime. <laughs> Everybody likes the quiet, but nobody wants the purification. <laughs> I know. It's like detoxing, you know? Everybody Woo. wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants mm -hmm. to die. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Hi, Julia. Hey, um, hi, Jesse. Hi, Sangha. Hi, Michelle. Hi. Um, did I ask last time about my friend on the religious right? I did. Okay. Yeah, and how to kind of how and to what degree to like engage with them about yeah, things that okay, you're that's in, funny. In... I must have yogi mind because I just sat for the past ten days in silence. <laughs> okay, never mind. No, it's great. I've been know. doing that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you got it figured out? Did you get it all sorted? Well, so like I just um I just sat for um 10 days and I just turned on my telephone where you can see the visual voicemail and um, she called like right when I entered retreat like um, so more than a week ago and so I have to call her back <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, maybe I should rewatch two weeks ago how you answered the question. <laughs> um, like it's probably posted, so maybe I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you for caring about the yogis. <laughs> yeah, I would maybe give yourself a, a little space. <laughs> I mean, it's like you're fragile, you've just been sitting, you're quiet, like this sense, I appreciate, and I think we all can, that sense of pressure, of like social pressure to feel like this person is waiting and the implications of them not hearing back from you right away and, 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 and the, um, you know, um, and then there's another sense of like, it's like if we can get there too of like, you know, that that pressure is not real. It's like totally not real. That is like something we are conjuring. And, um, wow. and that maybe you just decide to re-engage according to more wholesome motivations when and if they emerge, you know, so that the sense of like rather doing it out of tension and anxiety and guilt and worry and the things that kind of can build in that way, knowing that that might be a little bit of a setup to like a not so great interaction. Um, yeah. Not that there's any way to, you know, whatever, you know, plan for it, but just to have that f sensitivity. So like, what is it like to kind of give yourself a little bit of adjustment period? They've already waited 10 days. Right. They, you may be their enemy now. You may, they may have forgotten about you. Who knows? Uh, and it's like, why not just like give yourself a little bit of acclimate, acc Acclim acclimatizing to the you know back into things and engaging with people maybe who are a little easier <laughs> uh you know and make the decision from a little bit of a different place you know um but it's you know but i also understand you know the the urgency you know sometimes we can feel yeah that helps a lot actually it's like you know so this afternoon, I felt like I should, you know, come out of the retreat and I, I wanted to give a buffer zone and didn't make a list of things to do, but I did laundry and I checked the emails and I went to the grocery store 
and a friend drove by and we got exuberant and and um yeah like which is so funny because the thing from retreat sometimes is like feeling like the ultimate act of nonviolence is turning all of the sense doors completely um, internal to like a coolness and so it's interesting that I'm like on the verge of robbing myself of that you know mm. yeah yeah, yeah. Are are you like hesitant to call because you kind of labeled your friend a certain way? And so I'm just wondering if there's a kind of um, ease, like when you feel ready to call, it's you feel like you're not anticipating difficulty, or are you are you genuinely anticipating um, difficulty? For yourself, it might not even be obvious, but I'm just wondering because you didn't just say a friend. You said a friend who blah, 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 right? So <laughs> when somebody says that, I'm just checking to see, is there something about that that is making you more hesitant or? Wow. Oh, that's the $84,000 question. Thank you. It's like, what is it? You know, sometimes when you see that someone called, you're like, oh, we have the same value system and I have all these happy memories of getting along great. And then um, this person, it's like we, we've always gotten along fine, but this ideological possible different so it's like that there's the potential for non fluidity or mm -hmm. the potential for things um uh, i guess there's the potential for relational growth <laughs> through <laughs> Um, like there might be challenge or it might not be predictable or straightforward. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to just offer something that might not be helpful, but um, it's from a ways back. But um, when I first started practicing um, the meditation center IMS in Massachusetts was right near where I grew up. And so um, I would stop by and visit them, my father and stepmother on the way in and out or, you know, when I was working there and um, my stepmother didn't like me. And, but I, if I wanted to talk to my father, my stepmother always answered the phone. My father never answered the phone. So the, isn't this interesting? Like if I called, I had to talk to her who actually was very hostile. And so when I started doing retreats and then I'd come out and I'd want to visit and say, I'm coming, I'd have to face calling her. So I, it's a very interesting thing because it would be just so hard. And then one retreat, I just thought, oh, this is what happens when I call my stepmother. It's like, it's unpleasant. <laughs> like, it was like, it was so clear that I just wasn't accepting that it was going to be unpleasant. Do you see? So it was more like just this like shift from like this, res the resistance, which was so painful because it, it was inevitable that it would be unpleasant. 
like it just that's just how the nature of the relationship but like once i could just accept that it was going to be unpleasant it didn't make it pleasant and i think that's one of our mistakes is that we'll think if i accept this then it's not going to be unpleasant it was it was unpleasant yeah. and as the as the time went on she was convinced that everyone running ims were communists and she was anti-communist and you know like it <laughs> it was just like it just kept growing into more and more like, like duked out conversations about like what was going on and then i made the mistake of giving her the book i am that wow that was like book. i know she hated that book i mean she just hated that book and it was just like wow that was a mistake like it just like i was trying to kind of find a place of i love that book you know right but like yeah. but yeah. do you see what i mean there was just that there was if there was connection it was going to be mostly unpleasant and they were once in a while something okay but it was just the nature of it and i'm not saying that that's how intense this friendship is but in the description that you made where you're implying there are value differences usually with that level of value difference then there's going to be something that said for her probably for you or her or him and and for for you with them like it's like it's just the nature of the um, value difference so I'm just saying that if you like, I agree with Jesse, you know, just you don't have to call right away. If you just came out of retreat, you can say, I just came out of retreat. You can text and say, I'm not quite ready for phone calls yet, but whatever. But um, I'm just saying that just to be careful of not knowing that where the resistance is, is where the suffering is. Mm -hmm. Where there is yeah. Yeah. Does that does that make sense? Just that. Well, so it's two things where the resistance is is where the suffering is, and that it might not be an interaction with this person that's free of unpleasantness. And it's like, I'm thinking of Ajahn Tomato, like, or Lumpur, like, it's like this. He just says, it, it's like this. Yeah. But I would remind myself every time I call, I'm just yeah. saying that, like, I would get myself ready, like, okay, this is what happens when I call. And then it was okay. Like it was, I'm not, but I'm, I really want to make clear that by okay, it didn't mean that my acceptance made this situation pleasant. It was that I was accepting that it was mostly unpleasant. Our... A I N. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and D okay. and definitely D R O P. There's a whole D R O P. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I yeah, and maybe not having to get it all done right away. I hope not. Yeah. yeah. Well, geez, yeah. <laughs> I, but I, I think that question, <laughs> that whatever that is, whatever the getting it done yeah. ever, it just points to, it points to some place where we also, where we're, where it's just like, where, what is it? What is it like to try to resolve samsara and find some way to work with it? And what is it to try, like, to play saint, like, for, with the relationship and see what that's like, right? So, so this idea, and, and I think that it's, it's 
it's like what Michelle says around like that's a resistance that's painful. It's like okay, well, what is this resistance? What is the nature of what are the qualities of it? You know, there's a there's a level to which a lot of it is this sense of wanting to be heard, wanting to be understood, wanting people to agree with us. It's like these social sort of dynamics, but it's me. It's me. It's it's, it's very like me centered, right? And and I don't want to dismiss that as an important part of our lives is relationships under in which like we feel either we're understood or there's a mechanism to feel understood where we share values or there's a mechanism to negotiate values um where people are you know respectful and i mean there's all these uh, like you know the realm of what we might think of as like healthy um relationship and that we have needs and our needs are met and we try to fulfill other people's needs and you know what's appropriate and what isn't like there's all this negotiation of all of these things i don't mean to d- dismiss that project right that's something we're all involved with in all of our relationships probably there's also the question of what if what is it like to interact with people in a way that isn't based on our own need system or to play around with that or explore that. What is it like where it's like, well, my interactions are really about just trying to be loving, right? Or just trying to understand, um, uh, just like, let's just say those two things. Like if that was the, the, the totality of our engagement with another person, of like trying to understand and trying to care about them. You can see that that is not going to be satisfying to a bunch of things that feel like familiar ways of satisfying ourselves, right? And and validating relationships and valuing them and understanding what what their use is for us. And yet there is a different kind of quality that can emerge in that that is worth experimenting with in different places. And so I think it's just one, and, and with any, with all relationships, and there may be some relationships more than others, what can be hard is it feels like sometimes you're giving up a level of intimacy, um, you know, what feels like sort of a, a kind of nourishment of self in that. But what you can gain is a, is a, cleanliness uh, uh, a spaciousness and a kind of purity of heart that also is very beautiful um, I think I'm coming from it a different point of view though like like I totally appreciate what you're saying but I feel like I'm I'm wanting to come at it from a point of like uh, like spaciousness and ease and loving and including everyone. And it's not so much about me having my political ideas heard, Mm -hmm. but it does feel unclean if I'm going to be keeping my mouth shut on the mundane level about someone who doesn't want to be friends with people who have single parents or who are gay. Right. And 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 so that only leaves her, you know, 17 or 18 percent of the United States population left to be friends with. And like, I, I don't actually fall into those categories, but I have a lot of friends who do. And so it, but it doesn't feel like so much about me. It it's more like. I feel like it might end the friendship and that might mean that i mean like how do buddhas and bodhisattvas include the whole universe in relationship because i can't i can't i want to maintain like this loving human connection but i'm afraid that it will like break up the friendship with her and her husband I think that's what it is. So it's like wanting it's so it doesn't feel so much about me. But it's wanting to love everybody and everything and thinking that the small relationship might just end. Right. Well, Michelle, you can say just I I just think that um, the the question around bodhisattvas or 
Buddha or monks and nuns, often people who are very enlightened are pretty quiet and there's not a lot of chit chat. Like chit chat just isn't a big deal. So I think that a lot of what you're, the kind of conversation that would happen wouldn't be happening because chit, like chit chat isn't like part of a lot of a, a very quiet beings way. Um, and so it's like if I just imagined what you're asking around somebody like Deepama, having been around her a lot, it, it, she just wouldn't have even engaged it. She just would have showered the person with metta, but there wouldn't be like an engagement of the conversation, but it would be very clear that she loved everyone. That's the point, is that she did love everyone. It wasn't like she was trying to love everyone including everyone who disagreed with her or I mean it was just like so pure and that metta was so strong so that metta is unconditional and I can talk from my own ex I can only talk from my own experience where I have a um, very beloved person in my family that I rescued when she was pretty much born and um, wow she she just like was obviously um going in the direction of very far religious right, even when she was a little, really little, like just like, it was awesome just to just watch the difference between her and me having kind of spent so much time guiding her. And um, I think when somebody's like that in your family and you're, and you want to, like you see, I kind of took it as the long haul, like the long haul is, our lifetime together and there's a way in which you're asking a very important question because it's around how we're all related and that the the practice of unconditional love and being here for the long haul doesn't necessarily mean It, well, or it, necessi it necessitates for me, for example, I felt like I had to keep that relationship going. Do you see what I mean? That I had to do things that I would say things and she knew we were very much on the opposite side of so much. And yet over time, because there was so much metta, I think that she trusted the metta, she trusted the metta from the get go. And that was very, it was hard for her. It was very conflicting for her to have such a different value system. And yet there was so much metta. Do you see? I'm not sure if this is clear enough, but it's very palpable for me at this point in my life at 71 and she's 60. Um, that the connection is metta it always was and it it feels like i don't know something could shatter it um but i don't think so because um that's the base and but i don't think that that necessarily excludes not being able to talk to somebody i just don't think metta excludes anything i think um i was fortunate with her that my um family member that we managed to make it through it and um it's not, if it wasn't like that i wouldn't have thrown her out of my heart i would have just not had conversations <laughs> you know what i'm saying like it's like i, I just you're describing how i want to be like what i feel like my true self is and that means that it could be that you don't have you don't have the friendship that you want to have with this person, but you won't throw her out of your heart. Or it could be that you will have it. Like I don't think you can know. I, none of us know this with anyone ever, forever. It's just like we just have to work on the unconditional, and then with the um, conditional, sometimes we hit an edge. Like I would say the amount of acceptance I could do with my relationship with my stepmother made it possible for us to tolerate each other, <laughs> which, which was a lot. Like it was a lot that we could do that and we could 
talk on the phone and, you know, be civil. But it wasn't like we were best buddies yeah. at all, you know. But she wouldn't have been somebody I would have been friends with if she wasn't my stepmother. Right, right. I don't know, but that doesn't, I, it doesn't mean that I didn't have metta for her. If I didn't make it through that, those barriers and was able to have enough practice and patience and distance, a lot of distance to do it, it's like, then I don't think I would have thrown her out of my heart. I just wouldn't have had as much contact. I don't know. And I do just want to yeah. really, I, I want to just go back to that original thing of like you, my encouragement is just to explore and to really be sensitive. Like you can say that it's not about you, but I think what, it's wor it's always worth being aware of like our own need system in any relationship and so the anxiety of losing the friendship or the anxiety about the world and the implications of what you're able to convince this person of or convey or come to understanding in terms of the, what that means for the world those are personal those are those are real you know functional things and again i'll just say i'm not dismissing that if you go back to the last conversation we had about it yes it's like the whole thing about there are ways of arguing with people there's ways of discussing views that still hold them in meta if our views aren't aligned right but if you if we are invested in coming to love through the reconciliation of views that's that's not going to happen and that is not what this path actually is right and it's like there's no way to that in terms of the world and so what does it mean to kind of unhook the meta from our own need system and our own anxieties and our own worries it, 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 i'm not saying there's an answer that's like just so i can say it but it's an important investigation and where are we experimenting and exploring with some relationships of ones where we're going to haggle and we're going to entangle and we're going to like try to resolve things on this level and where are there friendships where it's like oh it's so whatever that actually what is it like to try something very different to really try a different kind of behavior internally and and a little more sort of like vigilance with like where am i acting out of a, a kind of internal pattern of wanting to be met with something here where that's actually creating more of a mess and what is it like to try to simply be in a different place with that and 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 not because one way it's very rare that we actually change someone's mind about anything period and then w w not that letting go of that and just loving someone is necessarily going to change their mind but sometimes there is a way that that unhooks a kind of entanglement that can be very powerful you know so I'm, I'm not arguing against like having a position in the world or being forceful about that but i do think you're in an interesting place with this particular relationship that's worth like kind of exploring you know a and and to to be willing to face what we fear in that loss Oh, uh, do we feel like we don't have integrity if we're not constant, you know, whatever, defending certain notions? Do we feel, w w and what is the diff? anyway, all the stuff that one can explore there. But what is it, what is it like, I mean, I think to me it's felt recently of like, oh, to treat children like adults and to treat adults like children. You know what is what would that be like if you sort of like related to these other adults in this in a very different way and just explore it you know see what that feels like what is there a kind of purity of heart that we lose touch with when we're dealing with someone who's like we think is going to be able to operate on this sort of like cerebral level with us and um what is it like to maybe have a little inversion there Thank you both so much. This is so helpful. Um, thank you. Keep us posted. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just like to add about the times we're in is that I think that um, the climate is such that it's so um, 
easy for aversion to arise about so many things that are happening. I mean, if you're paying attention and you're taking in the media and it's, I think that um, the, the extremity of the suffering and the uh, insanity of it all uh, requires such um, willingness to get enough time to dig deep enough for the metta. Like, so it, I'm not saying that we don't, of course, we're going to be aversive or hateful or, you know, of course we accept that. But also it's like, um, I guess I feel you don't want to let that climate win. You don't want to let it win. You can't, we can't let it win. And so that, I feel like that kind of almost fierceness of like the fierceness of of um, the dedication to the understanding of what metta is is like it's not it's not it's really um, accepting that the behavior is horrendous, but that one can still not throw anyone out of their heart. That's that's relatedness. That's the Dhamma family. Whether you're relating to a shark or a ant or a human being or you you see what i'm saying a predator or a prey it's like we're born into this world um and the spiritual task is to um, get the chance to work harder and harder at this if it's getting harder for you it's it's it is it's getting harder <laughs> it's not like you know it's we're living in the Kali Yuga, like you know, things are going getting difficult. If you're not noticing, <laughs> it's like it's like if you're wondering if it's getting wobbly, it's getting wobbly, you know. Last night, Jesse and I looked up in the sky and we saw the um, <sighs> that what is it called, the Space Link or something, Starlink train, yeah. And I got so angry, I gotta say. I haven't been that angry, and I get angry. I'm an aversion type, but I just oh, so angry, and I looked it up, and I was just like, "Wow!" This you is know. for folks who don't know. This is Elon Musk's like Starlink <laughs> satellite system that he's covering the globe with. You'll see these <laughs> chains of satellites that we are. This was like 14, but sometimes they're like 40 or 60, and they're 60. like. An, and they're yeah. in a long line, and you look like it looks like an alien invasion is happening. Um, and I only learned about this last week from a friend who saw it. So your fair warning, if you see <laughs> this in the sky, it's our own homegrown invasion. But it, what I'm trying to say is that um, this wasn't even this racism or, you know, all this friggin' nutso stuff that's going on. This is just like somebody who's wealthy enough to put this crap out there. Sorry, I have a few... <laughs> about this obviously but we're losing the sky like there's there's you know it's like we're losing the sky and yet you know i had to face that i had all these opinions about all of it and then had to kind of finally work with the aversion to it and to metta and like hold it to you know just like that tit not han we're on this boat and you know some of us have to like be peaceful enough not to drown the boat ourselves, right? In whatever way we can. But it was a shock. I have to say, I I, um, I didn't know what it was going to look like. And it was a real shock. And that's, again, in terms of amounts of suffering on the planet. It, in some ways, you could say it's minor in comparison, but it is shocking. So we, that's why we come together every Sunday, right? Like it's like to encourage us all to like hold, have that dedication to the peace and the love and to um, know that it, it's, it's requiring dedication <laughs> and support.
I guess it's going to become don't look up. <laughs> don't look up. Mm. Uh, Here's, I found the Myatang Sayadaw's Buddha here. We can okay. end with that. A, there we go. Oh, so happy. Oh, the rose. Yeah. Yeah. Always, yeah. <laughs> the fake flowers are doing great. The other ones yeah. are. Shading. <laughs> anyway, he did Put this. Put on the top there, too. Yeah. You can't quite see it. Yeah. yeah. He, this is the thing about Burma. You find that actually these, it's like doing these so-called preliminary practices is where all this confidence and faith are developed before you're trying to do the wisdom practice. And it's like, you feel so protected. You feel so worthy. There's so much faith that that's what he taught me. Happy Sayadaw, Myatang Sayadaw, he taught me that um, we need that protection of worthiness. Oh, I'm sorry I mouthed off about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. It was such a surprise. Sorry. <laughs> Take care, everyone. We'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs>